Welcome to The Calling Uncensored, a podcast for awakening souls on the courageous path of becoming. I'm your host, spiritual teacher and messenger, Sarah Rose. I am obsessed with shining a light on the often dark and turbulent process of awakening. You are being summoned. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of The Calling Uncensored. I'm your host, Sarah Rose, spiritual transformation coach and divine business strategist to spiritual entrepreneurs. And today I have a very special guest on the show, Lisa Roulette. She has an amazing story. But before I dive into her interview, I just wanted to give a shameless promotion for the Evolve program. We're going on our third enrollment for Evolve, and the doors will be opening soon. So depending on when you listen to this episode, it may already be open. But I'm opening enrollment only for a short period of time with some very, very limited bonuses at the very beginning of the enrollment period. So So if you're interested in this, you can always go to my website at sarah-rose.net or you can visit the URL in the show notes. I'll have a link for it there. Healing the inner child, clearing the sabotaging patterns once and for all. The women that are in that group are amazing and they all say one thing, that once they sign up, just so many aha moments and breakthroughs one right after another. So it's spiritual mentorship and transformation on steroids. It's designed for rapid transformation. If that is something that's interesting to you, visit the URL in the show notes or hit me up on on Instagram at Spiritual CEO. If you have any questions, you can also find me on Facebook. DM me and shoot me your questions. I'd love to chat with you. We can hop on a video chat. So without further ado, I want to welcome Lisa Roulette to the show. Hello, I am here today with Lisa Roulette. Um, She's here to join us and tell us a little bit about her story. Um, Lisa is a certified personal life coach, a Reiki master, EFT practitioner. She specializes in helping women heal relationship wounds and subconscious programming that are keeping them from living the life they truly desire. Uh, Lisa helps women become increasingly self-aware of their thoughts, emotions, and feelings, and guides them through various healing journeys to help them expand their consciousness and begin to manifest what they truly desire from life. So all of Lisa's work stems from her own healing journey, and today she's dedicated to helping women rise from depressed and blocked energies into higher frequencies so that they can shine their inner light and truly live a happy life. So I decided I needed to bring Lisa on um, as part of the Awakened Fempreneur series because I feel that her mission in the world is highly valuable and her story is highly valuable. And so without further ado, I just wanted to introduce Lisa. How are you doing today, Lisa? Hey, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So um, why don't you just go ahead and just tell us a little bit about, you know, your own healing journey that started all of this. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, when I was 26 years old, I lost my brother who was my only sibling and my best friend. And that produced a, obviously a massive void in my life. It was also a transformational time. I think, you know, when you're in your late twenties, you're sort of coming out of childhood and really moving into adulthood. And I felt like I lost all grounding and all footing with his death. I was living in Manhattan and, um, I had actually planned a move to where he lived in Colorado prior to his death. So my whole life was uprooted and um, it took me a good couple years to come out of an intense state of grief. And that's when I met my first husband. I met my husband in Baltimore. And so I moved to Baltimore, Maryland, and um, we did what every young couple did, did. You know, we got married, we got dogs, we had kids. We bought a house and we bought another house. We started renovating a house. And within five years of marriage, when my second child was nine months old, he died in in his sleep. So needless to say, my life once again was just completely uprooted. And um, it was just a horrific event. I had had, had, no idea how I was going to survive and care for my kids on my own. I was working for an international company, so I had to quit my job, and obviously my husband's employment ended. We had, were in the middle of building a pretty big house, and I had to sell that house, and I just really, I hit rock bottom. 
couple years after that, I got into a relationship with a very, very toxic individual. He was a narcissist and came into my life sober, but ended up starting to use again while I was with him. And I felt as if I was in love with him. And then of course, like most of most women thought I might be able to save him, which obviously ended in a complete disaster. So when that relationship was over, I entered into a clinically depressed state. And obviously like every other person, I was in therapy, I was on medication, I was in support groups, I was in counseling, you name it. I was trying to heal my life, but nothing was working. And really, I think the final blow was my, my best friend of 20 years betrayed me at a level that just was so unbelievable. I was looking for a new job and she contacted the employer and told the employer that I shouldn't be hired. And this was really about the livelihood of my children and being able to feed them and clothe them and provide for them. And when that happened, I fell off the grid. I wanted to commit suicide. I had no will to live and that was it for me. Um, I even thought at one point that I should be hospitalized because my depression was so bad and I just didn't think I could be a fit mother to my boys. So I did again, what everyone else would do. You know, I started going to biweekly therapy sessions. I started going to multiple support groups. I saw counselors, life coaches. I mean, really, and I was completely alone during the time because when my best friend betrayed me, a large group of friends that we had together sort of went along with her. Um, so I got into this very like desperate alone state and I was very tempted to take my own life. I even at one point held a gun in my hand and decided that it was time to take my own life. But I had this inner calling that said, you know, look, you've got these two beautiful, amazing lives that are so worthy of a really happy, healthy mom. And it was in that moment that I decided to heal <laughs> and I had spent about 24 hours thinking about what healing meant and I determined that healing was not therapy, the healing was not medication, healing wasn't support groups, healing was an internal transformation that I had to seek out and I had to find and I had to do on my own. So it took me probably about three full years to surface and to really start to understand what the journey of healing not only is like, but to implement the knowledge that I was gaining during that time and to apply that knowledge as wisdom over my life as practice. As you know, I think that's one of the biggest missing pieces for a lot of people is the practice itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so after about the third year, when I resurfaced, I, in awe of myself, realized that I had healed my life. And I was ready to live again. And not only was I ready to live again, but I was also ready to build the life of my dreams. And so with that, I started to learn a lot about the mechanics of healing, manifesting, the law of attraction, the energy body, vibration, you know, all of that work that we do now on a daily basis and live our lives by. So it was a very rough journey and a very scary journey, but in the end, I feel so blessed and so grateful, so grateful because I would never be where I am today if I didn't, if I couldn't appreciate those experiences and I couldn't appreciate the journey at large. Wow. That's an amazing story. And to hear you come full circle in complete gratitude and um, just appreciation for your life experiences, despite how, you know, this, this is just a beautiful, you know, sight, a circle of coming full circle. Um, can you talk a little bit about when you talk about um, you came back to the surface, like you resurfaced? I think you said that was like a three or four year period and you realized that therapy wasn't the issue and like all of these other outside things weren't the issue. It was an internal thing that you had to do on your own. What did those three or four years look like? Like what, what was that before you resurfaced? What happened? Yeah. Well, first, the, the realization that nothing external of me was going to heal me came really, to be honest with you, when I was holding a gun in my hand. I guess it was just either my higher self or my God, my angels, my protectors, whatever it was, there was just this sort of flash of insight that said, not only is taking your life not the answer, but all of the means by which you're trying to heal are actually teaching you how to deal and not transcend what is hurting you now. 
So I didn't, but I, I, while I had that knowledge, that knowledge sort of downloaded and I understood it, I had no idea how to actually do it. How did I, how could I take those steps? Mm -hmm. So the preceding two, three years, I spent number one, almost completely alone with almost zero friends. And even the friends that I did retain from the, the break of friendships, um, I, I didn't see very often because I felt, well, I felt alone and I felt very lonely and I felt, I knew that there was this need for solitude and reflection and understanding. And so during those years, it was a, really about gaining knowledge and studying and, um, you know, I know in, in your last podcast, you talked about the synchronicity of that book that showed up over and over again. Well, in due time, I started to, synchronicities just started to happen everywhere and they started to unfold exponentially. I mean, they just, you know, once one happened, it was like, oh, okay, I got led there and there. And my thirst for knowledge became insatiable. And then I got to a point when I, when I actually resurfaced two or three years in, I realized that I had moved from really, really lonely to alone, which was a really beautiful space, a very trying space, but a really beautiful space where the transformations were taking place. They were all spinning forward. And at that two, three year mark, I took the knowledge that I had gained through study and started to actually apply it. And I think that's really, I know for my clients, that's where they are, they have a lot of trouble. They understand a lot, but they don't have enough faith in themselves to actually begin the practices that need to be put in place to make the transformations and to transcend where they are today to evolve into that person that they're really supposed to become. So I would say that it was almost like a dawn, if I could give an analogy, at first very, very dark, but as time went on during those two, three years, it was sort of like this, you know, this light started to grow, not only in my physical world, but inside of me as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, have, I can resonate with that. I feel like I turned my whole house into like my own little mini ashram and disappeared for like three or four years and spent most of my time in self-reflection and meditation and realized like intuitively that this was an inner journey that I had to do on my own. Mm -hmm. and very my you know different stories but the process of coming to this moment in your life where you realize that this is an inner game and that you have to and it is like you're being guided and you become even though I'm an extroverted person like I became very introverted very protective of like my space and wanting to be by myself and like you said went from feeling lonely into being like alone and those are two totally separate energies, right? Mm, totally. Yeah. So for all the moms out there who go through something like uh, that, that, you know, that have, you know, chaotic situations or turbulence in their life and things like that, how did you manage to do this when you had young children? How did you manage to slip away and go in, like go under underground for three or four years, like you say, and work on yourself? Well, I, I did, I, I was working at the time, I had to, I mean, there was no way, right. I, and, I, and I'm and i blessed because I have, you know, a really good traditional education and I have, I had really good work experience. I was a business development executive prior to losing my husband. So I was earning, I was earning. Um, mm -hmm. And I got that job that my ex best friend, <laughs> just just to put it out there, I ended up getting that job. But, um, but so I was earning, so I had at that time an au pair, but I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I remember I never felt like there was a place for release. And I didn't, again, during those years, it was a dawn. So it wasn't like I, like you said, you know, your whole house was like an ashram. And I didn't, I didn't have that at the time because I, that wasn't in my consciousness. That wasn't in my awareness. So I would literally, between work and coming home, I would literally take back roads just so I could cry, just so I could release. And just so I could understand because my kids, I mean, my my baby was nine months old when their dad died and my, my eldest was three. So really young. And I didn't want them to see that. I do think, and this may, may be a little off topic, but I think it's important to address for, for moms out there. I do know now that my kids are almost 15 and 12. Um, 
I, I, know, I know that they saw the grief. I know that they experienced the, the vibrations that were coming from me in various forms. I mean, there were times that I would lose my temper. There were times that I would lose my patience. There were times that I would just simply break down and cry and they wouldn't understand it. Mm-hmm. So I think that, I think there's a lot of, and we can talk about this if, if we address forgiveness, because I know that you've gone through that journey. And of course I have as well, but even now today, you know, I work with them a lot on understanding if they've forgiven me for the uncomfortable times and the the sort of the uneasy times. But I think all in all, I mean, I was, I can't, the light shone pretty quickly. I mean, I'm extremely nurturing person and mother. And so, I mean, they, I would say that, you know, my kids borderline worship me. They absolutely love me. They love my story. They love where where I've come and they love where I'm going. So they have a tremendous amount of respect for me and they honor me. And that's a huge blessing, but I, I don't know. I think, I think being a mom and feeling that level of guilt and feeling a need for forgiveness is natural. But I think if there's that open communication between you and your children, that can very easily be sort of managed and put to, to put to rest. Um, so do you have, um, when, when was it that first, I, I just want to sort of ask, cause I'm sort of curious. I know we carry like the same wounded healer archetype. Was there a point where you knew that all of this, like, was going to turn into um, purpose work down the road. Uh, did you ever have an, a knowingness of that along the way at any point? Or when did, I guess, let us clue us in a little bit on when the student was ready in the teacher period. When did, how did that transition happen to where you started to come full service, like full circle and be of service? So that happened sort of, if, if, I, if you, I use maybe those two, let's just call it two and a half years. The two and a half years were the dawn, was the dawn. And then, um, after that, I just, just synchronicities. I mean, people would say, you should talk to Lisa Roulette or, you know, um, would just call me or come to me and say, you've been through so much. You know, I feel, I feel ridiculous talking to you because, you know, my problems aren't nearly as big as yours. And I have always, well, I'm an empath, (laughs) um, which obviously makes the journey even more challenging from an emotional standpoint. But, um, you know, my first response was always, no, never, ever compare your journey to my journey, because what might be larger than life for you may not have been as significant for me. And that's so, I don't ever want people to think that. Um, but so, yeah, it was just synchronicity. I mean, people started to come to me and then I thought to myself, I said, you know what? And I hated the work that I was doing. I was in a miserable career. I absolutely deplored it. And I knew that I wasn't living my soul's purpose doing it. Mm-hmm. So I just, when I met my now husband, um, we were, I think we were, we weren't even engaged at the time, but I, I knew, I knew we were going to marry. And I asked him, you know, will you support me if I jump ship and, you know, for a couple of years, it's going to be rough and, you know, I'm going to have to figure it out and all of that. And he was like, absolutely. I will swim with you anywhere. And, you know, here we are today. So I'm very blessed. I love that. Yeah. Um, what would you say we, for other women listening to this that are, you know, maybe in that, well, I guess there's a, several, the types of women that might be listening to this podcast are maybe in the muck a little bit still trying to grow through it. And then obviously part of this Awaken Fempreneur series are when they are ready to move forward and they feel like they have come full circle enough to where they can give back and help others. And they're moving into a space of either being a teacher, healer, coach, or mentors of some kind. What kind of advice were you get? What, what were your biggest obstacles when it came to transitioning into that as a professional paid expert? Yeah. You know, in your, Cause I, I see a lot of women run into fraud syndrome and I see a lot of women play small and a lot of women hide from their story and hide from the exact things that are now their gift. Right. Um, so it's sort of like how I always love that Rumi quote, the wound is where the light enters yeah. and getting them to embrace like their story in a way that resonates with like, that's their goal, really. That's their goal. That's going to help resonate with other people that need this kind of healing work. So what, would, what kind of advice would you have for someone that's sort of starting on that journey? Listening Trust to- yourself. Trust. Mm-hmm. You know, as women, we... <laughs> We spend the first half of our lives taking care of everything outside of us. I mean, our homes, our dogs, our houses, our children, our spouses, our partners, our careers. We are just so outwardly focused. And there comes a time when the wounds call 
and they just say, we need attention. And that's when we go within. And all women have a natural greater insight into the healing process because we are nurturers and that's what we do. We take care of people, things, places, that's what we do. So in learning to re relearning to take care of ourselves, there is a, um, it, for some women, it's, it, it is just sort of like a download and an inner knowing for others like myself, I actually had to sort of learn via textbook and, and application. And I think the way that you build trust in yourself is by being very honest with yourself. You know, have I experienced the transformation or am I just reiterating someone else's work? Am I, can I trust that in working with another under individual that I can truly share my wisdom, show them how to apply it in their lives so that they can experience a transformation as well. So I think it's trust and then being just super honest with yourself because there are, I mean, even some of the most looked at popular spiritual mentors, manifesting mentors, healing mentors out there, there's a lot of garbage. It's a lot of garbage and you know, I mean, I can think of one in particular, and of course I would never name names because I would, I appreciate this person so much for, for forging the path for people like you and me. But at the same time, I, I can't see how this individual really drives a transformation. And that to me is sort of like a calling to all of the people that you're addressing right now, these femmepreneurs who are saying like, look, we've, we've been through the, the ringer and we have worked our asses off to expand and evolve into this really beautiful, powerful essence that has, that, that is meant to be shared with the world. It is really meant to be shared with the world. Nice. So trust, being honest with yourself and faith that you're on the right path. Yeah. I always say, I, I always say that faith and courage is the cover charge to your, to your dream business. When you step onto this path, like your faith will be challenged and tested. And there's like, there is a stepping into full faith at some point that is required and taking that scary, messy action without having to be perfect and stall on perfectionism and second guessing yourself and things like that. There's, but there's a deeper knowing that's pulling you forward. There's a calling, right? Why I named the podcast, the calling, obviously, because there, it really turns into more of like, you can't not do this really. It's like, right. you just can't, it's just, I think, I think that there is not just, is it a calling from the inner space, but there is a calling in the collective for our work. I mean, it is, it is where we are going toward the age of Aquarius, toward that expanded consciousness where we are not just lonely or alone, but we are all one. And so it is the work that we do and that we put out into the world that makes the environment cohesive. But obviously we need millions and millions and millions and millions, if not billions of us to be doing similar work so that we can all come back together, support each other, each other and co-create. I think the other message that I would give girls who are just starting out is 100% collaboration over competition. Do not compete in this space. There's no point. We all have something to offer. We're all using different language, but we all mean the same thing. And that really is about healing and manifesting because the two go hand in hand. And until we understand that that is how we work miracles, then we won't, we won't fully come together ever. So yeah, I think collaboration is huge. I love that. Yes. Collaboration. And I love that you said that about healing. Cause I always tell my clients in evolve that manifesting is a self healing process. Oh yeah. They go hand in hand and that's like yeah. part of what they're working on is evolve is exactly what we're talking about now. Sure. Um, so I love that. And now just to, while you, you brought up the collective consciousness and this calling to pull people forward, pull, you know, raise consciousness and raise healing of the planet on a collective level. So I just wanted to throw this out there and ask a question. Some people may have issues with it or whatever, but when you see, so very similar, you know, like the microcosm and the macrocosm reflect each other, right? But when you see that in your own life, some of your worst issues that you thought were issues at, at the time, your, you know, that to your detriment or whatever turned out to be part of the gift that you are now putting out into the world, right? You've completely alchemized that. How do you feel when you see things on the world stage bubbling up that reflect a wounding? How do you view those? Like when you see things on the political stage that are basically on the collective level, the equivalency of what, what your inner journey, your journey was like as a reflection. 
Well, I see it as obviously a need for healing, but um, I also see it as a contracted state of awareness. I mean, it's, that's just what it is. It's that our collectively, we have not all evolved. And, you know, I, I can say all day long, I teach consciousness, I teach self-awareness, I teach expansion, expansion, I teach transcendence, I teach healing as a way of manifesting a new life experience. But I think it's a calling. It, it, it needs to happen. It's like, you know, you look up in the, in the sky, you're not going to see stars unless there's a dark sky, right? It's the yin and the yang. And so we're still experiencing that yin and yang and seeing more of the shadow of the world rather than the light of the world. And it is because of people like you, me, and the women that you'll have on your podcast or that are and men who are potentially listening to the podcast that are meant to add and shine the light. And we hope that soon one day our leaders, more, well, more leaders, more because there certainly have been many, many leaders who are of light. And we're all of light, but it's just what we're, where we're pointing our awareness and where, where, where we're applying our energy. Um, but I believe that it is that we have to see these things. We ac actually have to see them for, to actually transform and transmute them. Yes, I totally, I wanted to get your take on that. And that's, that's exactly how I see it too. It's like an expression of what still is yet to be healed. And if we use that as a reflection, like that, that larger, you know, collective consciousness that we see on a world stage, like bubbling up in areas that instead of focusing so much on the issue of whatever's popping up, but realizing that that is just a reflection of where we're at collectively. And that just shows that there's more work for us to do individually, which in actuality, that's the only way we're going to get around that. It's the only right. way we're going to actually heal that part of our society or our communities or, or whatever on right. a global scale. You know, it's interesting because very early on in that sort of two and a half year time frame, I met a shaman. And um, one of the questions, I worked with him for a while, and one of the questions I asked him was, could I be a chosen one? And am I a light worker? Of course, this is coming from a very sort of naive, you know, viewpoint at the time because I didn't have the knowledge that I have now. And he looked at me and he said, well, of course you're the cho you're cho a chosen one. He said, but we all are. And he said, and of course you're a light worker because we all are, you mm -hmm. know, we are all of light and we are all chosen to live our soul's purpose. And it is meant to be a return to that from that alone, that individuation to that wholeness or all one. Mm -hmm. So the more, the more people who can start to perceive that and the more people that can actually teach that and share that, the better, you know, and I think our transition, we still have eons to go. Um, but I think our transition is now well underway and it's indicative of people like you starting podcasts to get the word out. It's indicative with people like me who are trying to, you know, coach in group programs. So I think we're, we're going there. The trajectory has changed, but it's not fast enough for you and me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not fast enough, damn it. <laughs> Patience is still one of the virtues that I have yet to master. <laughs> totally, totally. Well, thank you, Lisa, so much for sharing your story. Wow, it's such an amazing, inspiring story. I know like it's going to help so many women that tune into this podcast now and or years down the road. Mm -hmm. So thank I'm so you. grateful that you were able to make it on today and share that with us. Oh, thank you, Sarah. It was a pleasure and honor. I love it. Oh my God. Thank you. Um, so why don't you just tell everybody who's listening where they can find you, how they can work with you and things like that. Yeah. So you can go to Lisa roulette.com. It's just like the game. Lisa roulette.com forward slash heal T O to manifest. And you'll get, you'll end on a landing page. You'll click that link and then you'll see a video where I'll talk a lot about, about how things actually manifest and how we can heal wounds. And then you'll have an opportunity to take a free masterclass. So there's lots of goodies on that link. It's lisaroulette.com forward slash heal to manifest. And where can people find you on social media? Okay. So Facebook is healing coach, Lisa Roulette and Instagram is just Lisa Roulette, Lisa underscore Roulette. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Did you have any last final words or anything that you wanted to tell the audience or anything to wrap up? I think Number one, and this is, you know, my primary, um, my underlying teaching is that if you're having trouble manifesting something, whether it be financial well-being, a relationship, material abundance, even health and well-being, physical health and well-being, you have to understand that if you're not manifesting, it means that there's something that needs to be healed. There is a wound or a program that is running that you're not recognizing and you're not working with. So you have to recognize that every time you can, you're having trouble manifesting, it just means that something needs to be healed. And once you get that, 
ebb and flow, harmony, yin and yang, it'll be beautiful. Yes, yes. Manifesting is a self-healing process. Totally. Totally. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right, Sarah. Thank you. Lots of love. Bye. Namaste. If you got value from this episode, please subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And I'd love it if you leave me a review on iTunes. For more info beyond this podcast, or if you have a question you'd like answered in an upcoming episode, please visit thecallinguncensored.com. And for daily inspiration or to shoot me a DM, come hang with me on Instagram at spiritualceo. Namaste.